let me thank Emily DeVito, Ali Namji, Dr. Paul Sung, Vampire Weekend, Tim Robbins, Tom Dwayne, Linda Sansur, JP Patafio, Senator Nina Turner, Chris Shelton, Rosario Dawson, Spike Lee. I want to thank all of them for being here tonight and for the great introductions I've received. I don't think that there is any doubt but that our campaign today has the momentum. We have won seven out of the last eight caucuses and primaries. And when I look at an unbelievable crowd like this, I believe we're going to win here in New York next Tuesday. When we began this campaign 11 months ago, we were 60 points behind Secretary Clinton. In the last two weeks, two polls have us ahead of Secretary Clinton. The national poll has us defeating Donald Trump by double digits. What this campaign is about, and your presence here tonight knows that you all understand this, it is not just about electing a president, it is about creating a political revolution. It is about creating a government which works for all of us, not just wealthy campaign contributors. It is a campaign about not ignoring the veterans who sleep out on the street, the children the elderly, or the poor. It is about creating a government that creates a decent standard of living for every man, woman, and child. What this campaign is profoundly about is understanding that real change never occurs from the top on down. It is always from the bottom on up. What this campaign is about is the understanding that when we stand together, black and white and Latino and Asian American and Native American, when we do not allow the Donald Trumps of the world to divide us up, there is nothing we cannot accomplish. What this campaign understands is real change is when a hundred years ago, workers who were exploited, who worked seven days a week, 12 hours a day, stood together and said, we will be treated with dignity and respect. We're going to form a trade union. Yeah. 
And tonight, I want to take my hat off to the CWA. Thank you, guys. They are standing up. They are standing up to a greedy corporation that wants to cut their health care benefit, send decent paying jobs abroad, and then provide $20 million a year to their CEO. And Verizon is just the poster child for what so many of our corporations are doing today. And this campaign is sending a message to corporate America, you cannot have it all. And this campaign remembers that over the last hundreds of years, African Americans and their allies stood up, fought back, and said that America will not be built on segregation, racism, and bigotry. And millions of Americans stood together and made monumental change in this country. And this campaign remembers that 100 years ago, not a long time ago, women in America did not have the right to vote, could not get the education they wanted or the jobs they wanted. But women and their male allies stood up. They fought back. And they said that women in America will not be second-class citizenship. And this campaign remembers, interestingly enough, something that happened two or three blocks away from here. And that is that 47 years ago, the gay community said that in this country, right over here in the Stonewall Inn, that in this country, people will have the right to love each other no matter what their gender is. And this campaign understands the change that is taking place right now, this moment in American society. It is a change where people in the fast food industry stood up to McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's. And they said, we cannot survive on $7.25 an hour minimum wage. And they stood up, they organized, and suddenly the impossible began to happen. In Seattle, Washington, 15 bucks an hour. Los Angeles, San Francisco, 15 bucks an hour. Oregon, California, New York, 15 bucks an hour. What all of that is about is telling us that when people look around them at the status quo and they say that the status quo no longer works, and when they stand up by the millions, despite what others may tell you, yes, we can change the status quo. And that is what is happening all across this country 
today, and that is what the political revolution is about. It is about people looking around them and saying, how could it be that in this great country today, the top one-tenth of one percent now own almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent? How could it happen that the 20 wealthiest people in America now own more wealth than the bottom 150 million Americans? How could it happen that one family, the Walton family of Walmart, could own more wealth than the bottom 40 percent of the American people. And when we talk about corporate greed, and when we talk about a rigged economy, let me say a word about the Walton family. This is a family that owns the largest private sector employer. They are the largest private sector employer in America. And yet, because the wages that they pay are so low, many of their employees are forced to go on food stamps and Medicaid. What a rigged economy is about is when working families pay higher taxes to subsidize the wealthiest family in America. So I say to the Walton family, get off of welfare, pay your workers a living wage. Let me take a moment to tell you some of the differences which exist, some profound differences which exist between Secretary Clinton and myself. You can tell a lot about a candidate in the campaigns they run by how they raise the money they need to run those campaigns. When we began this campaign, we had to make a choice. Would we do what every other campaign is doing and establish a super PAC? We agreed with you. We do not represent the billionaire class. We do not represent corporate America. We do not represent Wall Street. We do not want their money. And then something absolutely amazing happened, something that in a million years I never would have dreamed would have been possible. And that is, we said, to the working families of this country, if you want a candidate who is prepared to stand up to big money interests, to take on the greed of corporate America, the fraud of Wall Street, if you want that candidate, we need your help. And amazingly, in the last 11 months, we have received almost seven million individual campaign contributions. That is more campaign contributions than any candidate in the history of this country at this point in a campaign. What that outpouring of support tells us
<coughs> Does anybody know what our average campaign contribution is? You got it. $27 average campaign contribution. And why this is revolutionary is that it shows we can run a winning campaign without being dependent on the big money interests. Now, Secretary Clinton has chosen to raise her funds in a very different way. She has a number of super PACs, and in the last filing period, her largest super PAC reported raising $25 million from special interests, including $15 million from Wall Street alone. In addition to that, as many of you know, Secretary Clinton has given a number of speeches behind closed doors on Wall Street where she received $225,000 a speech. Speeches given to Goldman Sachs and other giant banks. Well, you know what I think? I think if somebody gets paid 225000 for a speech, it must be an unbelievably extraordinary speech. It must be a speech that could solve most of the world's problems. It must be a speech written in Shakespearean prose. And I kind of think if that $225,000 speech was so extraordinary, she should release the transcripts and share it with all of us. But our differences with Secretary Clinton go beyond how we raise money. It goes to an issue which the media doesn't cover but it is an issue of extraordinary consequence for millions of Americans, and that is our disastrous trade policies, which are costing us millions of jobs. It didn't take a rocket, science, rocket scientist to figure out what corporate America wanted when they, they wrote NAFTA, and CAFTA and permanent normal trade relations with China and other trade agreements. What they wanted was pretty simple. What they said is, why do I want to pay a worker in New York or Vermont or any place else a living wage when I could shut down in this country, move abroad, pay people pennies an hour, and bring my product back into this country? That's what they wanted. That's what they got. And what has happened over the last 30, 40 years is we have seen tens of thousands of factories in America shut down. We have seen those jobs go to low-wage countries abroad. And we have seen millions of our brothers and sisters in this country lose their decent paying jobs. And what we have also seen is a race to the bottom. We have seen employers say to workers, if you don't take a pay cut, if you don't take a cut in your health benefits, we're going to move abroad. And the result of that, the result of that is that so many of our workers have seen a decline in their wages and their benefits. I want to tell you that I not only opposed every one of these disastrous trade agreements, I helped lead the opposition to them.
On the other hand, Secretary Clinton supported virtually every one of these awful trade agreements. And let me say to corporate America tonight, if you think that you are going to continue to destroy the middle class of this country, if you think that you are going to continue to throw American workers out on the street and move abroad, you got another guest coming, because it ain't going to happen if I'm president. Everybody, everybody here knows that one of the most important functions of a president is to conduct foreign policy and military policy. The most important and consequential foreign policy debate in the modern history of our nation took place in 2002. President Bush and Vice President Cheney Don Rumsfeld and all the rest, they told us that we had to go to war against Iraq. I listened very carefully to what they had to say. I concluded they were not telling the truth. I not only voted against that war, I helped lead the opposition to that war. <laughs> Secretary Clinton, she was then in the Senate, I was in the House, she heard the same evidence that I did. She voted for that war. And then, interestingly enough, a few months ago in a debate that we had, she mentioned with pride that she was praised for her work as Secretary of State by Henry Kissinger. Well, in my view, in my view, Henry Kissinger was one of the most destructive Secretaries of State in the history of this country. And I surely would not welcome his praise. Another issue out there where there are very profound differences between the Secretary and myself. One of the looming crises facing our country and the world is whether or not we are going to have enough clean water. I believe that it is insane to be poisoning the water in our country and in countries throughout the world through fracking. And that is why, if elected president, I will move to a national ban on fracking. Secretary Clinton's position is different, and interestingly enough, as Secretary of State, she actually aggressively pushed fracking in countries all over the world. Right now, in this city, my state of Vermont, all over this country, there are millions of senior citizens and disabled veterans and people with disabilities who are trying to make it on $11,000, $12,000 a year Social Security. And you know and I know that no one can make it on $11,000, $12,000 a year. You can't pay for your medicine. You can't pay to heat your apartment. You can't pay for your health care. You can't pay for your food. Not on $11,000, $12,000 a year. 
the Republic, my Republican colleagues in the Senate, they've got a brilliant idea in response to this crisis. They want to cut Social Security. Well, I got some bad news for them. We're not going to cut Social Security. We're going to expand Social Security benefits. And I have introduced legislation and will fight for that as president, which does the following. Right now, you have the absurdly unfair situation where somebody makes $5 million a year, somebody makes $118,000 a year. They both contribute the same amount into the Social Security Trust Fund. That's wrong. At a time of massive income and wealth inequality, what we've got to do is lift the cap. You start off at 250000 and above, and if you do that, you can significantly expand benefits for people making 16000 or less and extend the life of Social Security for 58 years. Now, that's what I believe. That's what I think is the right thing to do. Because you don't turn your back on the people who built this country, on elderly people who are hurting and vulnerable. It's the right thing to do because a great country is remembered not by how many millionaires and billionaires it has, not by how many nuclear weapons it has, but by how it treats the weakest and most vulnerable among us. Now, that is what I believe. I have challenged Secretary Clinton time and time again. Are you prepared to expand Social Security benefits and lift the cap and demand that the wealthiest people in this country contribute more to Social Security. I am still waiting for her response. Now, this campaign is gaining ground every day because we are doing something unusual in American politics, we are telling the truth. We are telling the truth, and that is that we have a corrupt campaign finance system which is undermining American democracy. Democracy, to me, is one person, one vote, not billionaires buying elections. <laughs> Democracy is not the Koch brothers and a few of their billionaire friends spending $900 million in this campaign cycle. That is not democracy, that is oligarchy. We do not accept that. We do not accept Republican governors suppressing the vote and making it harder for poor people or people of color to vote. If I'm elected president, there'll be one criteria for voting in 50 states in this country, if you're 18 years of age or older and a citizen, you have the right to vote. End of discussion. And together, together, we are going to overturn this disastrous Supreme Court decision called Citizens United.
This campaign is about not just overturning and changing a corrupt campaign finance system. It is about profoundly changing a rigged economy. When I grew up in Brooklyn, The American dream, the American dream was alive and well. My dad came to this country from Poland at the age of 17, didn't have a nickel in his pocket, never made much money. We lived in a three and a half room rent controlled apartment. But he and my mother worked hard and my brother, their dream was for my brother and I to be able to have a higher standard of living than they did. That is the American dream, the dream of millions and millions of families all over this country. Parents work hard, their kids do better. Together, we will not allow that American dream to die. Together, we are going to create an economy that works for all of us, for the elderly, the children, the sick, the poor, the middle class, and the working families of this country, not just the 1%. And that means that we're going to raise the national minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour. That means that women will no longer be working for 79 cents on the dollar compared to men. Women in America want the whole damn dollar in their right. And I know that every man here is going to stand with the women in the fight for pay equity. I was in Flint, Michigan several months ago. And what I saw and what I heard in Flint, Michigan is something that I will never forget as long as I live. And it was something that I could not believe was happening in the United States of America in the year 2016. To talk to parents whose children had been poisoned by lead in the water. To talk to parents, to talk to parents who witnessed and saw day by day the cognitive abilities of their children decline. Unspeakable. But it is not just Flint, Michigan. We have water systems all over this country that are failing, wastewater plants that are inadequate, roads and bridges that need massive repair, mass transit systems that need rebuilding. airports, levees, and dams. This is America. Our infrastructure should not be collapsing. And that is why, together, we are going to rebuild our infrastructure, a trillion dollars over five years, creating 13 million decent paying jobs. And my critics say, well, Bernie, that's a nice, ambitious idea. How are you going to pay for it? Let me tell you exactly how we're going to pay for it right now. You have large, profitable corporations who, over the years, stash their profits in the Cayman Islands and in other tax havens. 
You have corporations who in a given year, companies like Verizon, like General Electric, ended up paying not one nickel in federal taxes, and we're losing $100 billion a year because of that tax loophole. Well, corporate America, bad news. Change is coming. You're going to have to start paying your fair share of taxes. We're going to use that $100 billion a year to invest in our infrastructure and create millions of decent-paying jobs. This campaign is listening as best we can to people whose voices are not often heard. We are listening to our brothers and sisters in the African-American community. And they are asking, how can it be that we had trillions of dollars to spend on a war in Iraq, a war we never should have gotten into, but we apparently don't have the money to rebuild the crumbling inner cities of America. I have been to inner cities in this country where people are paying 50 or 60 percent of their limited income on housing because there is no affordable housing. I have been in communities where gentrification is destroying communities. I have been in inner cities where there are no grocery stores or bank branches, where unemployment is off the charts and the schools are inadequate. So I say, that instead of rebuilding the infrastructure of Iraq and Afghanistan, we're going to rebuild the inner cities of America. This campaign is listening to our brothers and sisters in the Latino community. There are 11 million undocumented people in this country. Many of them are being exploited because when you have no legal rights, your employer can do anything he wants to you. Many of them are living in fear, and many of them are living in the shadows. I believe that this country must move forward toward comprehensive immigration reform and a path toward citizenship. And if Congress does not do its job, I will use the executive powers that the President has to do everything I can. This campaign is listening to people whose voice is almost never heard, and that is the people in the Native American community. We owe the Native American people a debt of gratitude we can never repay. And yet, from before this country became a country, Native Americans were lied to and cheated and treaties they negotiated were broken. Native Americans have taught us so much. They have taught us that we are part of nature, that we have got to live with nature, and that the human species will not survive 
if we continue to destroy nature. This campaign is listening to young people. And young people are asking a very simple question. They are asking, how does it happen when their parents and their teachers and everybody said to them, go out and get a good education? And they did that. They got the best education they could, and yet they leave school thirty, fifty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 in debt. And sometimes it takes decades for them to pay off that debt. We should be rewarding people who get the education they need, not punishing them. And when I talk about higher education, it's not just college. We have millions of great people who want to go out and be plumbers and carpenters and sheet metal workers. And they need the job training to get the good jobs that are out there. The world has changed over the last 50 years, and we have got to redefine in America what public education means. It is not good enough anymore to talk about public education being first grade through 12th grade. In my view, when we talk about public education today, it's got to mean public colleges and universities tuition free. There are hundreds of thousands of bright young people out there qualified, did well in school, who can't go to college because their families lack the funds. That is crazy. We are not going to be competitive in the global economy unless we have the best educated workforce in the world. I want every kid in this country, including kids who grew up in families like mine without a lot of money, I want them to know that if they do well in school, if they take school seriously, despite the income of their families, yes, they will be able to get a higher education. This is not a radical idea. It exists in countries all over the world. And you know what? 50 years ago, it used to exist in this country, in this city. Check out how much tuition was at City University, City College, Brooklyn College 50 years ago. Virtually free. If we could have virtually free tuition 50 years ago in America at our great public colleges and universities, we damn well can do it today. What people say, they say again, Bernie, you're thinking too big. Your ideas are just, you know, just. <laughs> yes, your ideas are too huge. I don't think so. In fact, what this campaign is precisely about is thinking outside of the box thinking outside of what the options that the media tells us we have got to consider. Let me tell you what is radical. Radical is not making public colleges and universities tuition-free. What's radical is in the last 30 years, there has been a massive transfer of wealth from the middle class of this country to the top one-tenth of one percent. That is radical. Radical is not saying that kids in America can go to college regardless of their income. That's common sense. 
Now, my opponents and the establishment and all of the media guys, they say, well, how are you going to pay for this idea, Bernie? You're giving away all the free stuff. You're Santa Claus. You're a nice guy. Let me tell you precisely how we will pay A, to make public colleges and universities tuition free, B, to substantially lower student debt. We're going to pay for it by imposing a speculation tax on Wall Street. Now, everybody here knows that eight, nine years ago, as a result of the greed, the recklessness, and the illegal behavior on Wall Street, this country was plunged into the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. Millions of people, including, I am sure, people here tonight, Millions of people lost their jobs, they lost their homes, and they lost their life savings. And then after the greed and illegal behavior of Wall Street helped destroy this economy, Wall Street and their lobbyists went running to Congress and they said, bail us out, bail us out. Well, against my vote, Congress did bail out Wall Street. Well, I believe that now it is Wall Street's time to help the middle class of this country. And a tax on Wall Street speculation will bring in more than enough income to pay for free tuition at public colleges and universities and lower student debt, and that's exactly what we should do. And what this campaign is talking about is not just the corrupt campaign finance system and a rigged economy, it is talking about a broken criminal justice system. And this criminal justice system is really quite remarkable. Just the other day, Goldman Sachs reached a formal settlement with the United States government for $5 billion. And in doing that, what they essentially acknowledge which is what other major banks also acknowledged, is they were selling worthless packages of subprime mortgage loans and ripping off investors and fellow Americans. And they reached a settlement for five billion bucks because of that illegal behavior. But here is what is rather remarkable. Today, some kid in New York City gets arrested for possession of marijuana. That kid will carry a police record with him for the rest of his life, which is serious stuff. But if you are an executive on Wall Street and your illegal behavior destroys the lives of millions of Americans, you don't get a police record, you get an increase in your compensation package. And together, we are going to bring justice back to the criminal justice system. And when we talk about criminal justice, every person here and every American should be ashamed that we in this country have more people in jail than any other country on Earth. 2.2 million Americans in jail. We're spending $80 billion a year locking them up.
Together, we are going to bring about real criminal justice reform, and we're going to significantly reduce that prison population. And I'll tell you how we're going to do it. Right now in America, kids who graduate high school between 17 and 20 have outrageously high rates of unemployment. White kids, 33 percent. Latino, 36. African American, 51 percent. We are going to invest in our young people in jobs and education, not jails and incarceration. And we are going to bring about police department reform all over this country. You are tired, and I am tired, of seeing those videos on TV of unarmed people being shot by police officers. Now, I was a mayor of Burlington, Vermont, for eight years, and I worked closely with our police department and police officers all over this country. And the truth is that the overwhelming majority of police officers are honest, they are hardworking, and they have a very difficult job to do. That's the truth. But the other truth is that like any other public official, if a police officer breaks the law, that officer must be held accountable. And the truth is that we've got to demilitarize local police departments. The truth is that we have got to make local police departments reflect the diversity of the communities they serve. The truth is that we have to end private corporate ownership of prisons and detention centers. The truth is that we have to rethink the so-called war on drugs. Over the last 30 years, millions of Americans have received police records for possession of marijuana. Today, marijuana is a, is a Schedule I drug under the Federal Controlled Substance Act. I believe that we should remove marijuana from the Federal Controlled Substance Act. States determine the legality, if they want to legalize marijuana or not, but it should not be a federal crime. But when we talk about drugs, let's understand something that is serious business, and that is we have an opiate and heroin epidemic in this country. That every day in New York, Vermont, all over this country, people are dying of heroin and opiate overdoses. In my view, the best way to address that crisis is to understand that addiction and substance abuse is a health issue, not a criminal issue. Which is why we need a revolution in mental health treatment in this country. People should be able to get the treatment that they need when they need it, not six months from now. I am a member of the U.S. Senate Committee on the Environment. I have talked to scientists all over the world, and anyone who tells you that climate change is not real 
is not caused by human activity, is lying to you. We have a moral responsibility to tell the fossil fuel industry that their short-term profits are not more important than the future of this planet. And together, we will transform our energy system away from fossil fuel to energy efficiency and sustainable energy. Now, I have been criticized for saying the following, so I want to make sure there is no confusion or ambiguity, and I will say it again. In my view, health care is a right of all people, not a privilege. The Affordable Care Act, and I'm on the committee that I helped write the Affordable Care Act, has done a number of very important and positive things. But despite the gains of the ACA, 29 million Americans still have no health insurance. Many of you are underinsured with high deductibles and copayments. And every one of us is ripped off every day by the greed of the pharmaceutical industry who charge us the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. And on top of all of that, we end up spending far, far more per capita on health care than do the people of any other country. In my view, now is the time for us to go forward toward a Medicare for all single-payer program. Brothers and sisters, this is a pivotal moment in American history. And all over this country, millions of Americans are looking around them. And they're looking at the status quo politically, they're looking at the status quo economically, they're looking at the status quo environmentally and socially and racially, and they're saying the status quo is not working. It's just not working for ordinary Americans. And they are asking themselves, why should we accept more income and wealth and equality in America than any other major country on Earth? Why should we allow income and wealth and equality to be worse here in America than any time since 1928? Why should we accept a proliferation of millionaires and have the highest rate of childhood poverty of almost any major country on Earth. Why should we be the only major country that does not guarantee paid family and medical leave? Why should we tolerate a dysfunctional childcare system in which millions of working families cannot find affordable quality child care for their kids? Why should we have more people in jail than any other country? Why aren't we doing more to combat a crumbling infrastructure, roads, bridges, water systems? Why are we not more aggressive in transforming our energy system? Why are we allowing billionaires to buy elections through a corrupt campaign finance system? These are the questions. These are the questions that millions of Americans are now asking themselves. And what they are concluding is that establishment politics and establishment economics are not going to address those crises. What they are concluding is we cannot take seriously candidates who receive millions of dollars 
from the most powerful and greedy special interest in America, who then go forward and say, we're going to stand up to those special interests. Nobody believes that. And what the American people are now understanding is that the only way we take on Wall Street, take on corporate America, take on the corporate media, take on the wealthy campaign contributors, the only way we do that is when millions of people stand up and demand a government that represents all of us. All of us, and not just the one percent. Now, on Tuesday, or next Tuesday, there is an enormously important Democratic primary here in New York State. And this is a tough race for us, in that we are taking on someone who obviously was a United States Senator here for eight years. And we have a, a system here in New York where independents can't get involved in the Democratic primary, where young people who have not previously registered and want to register today just can't do it. So this is going to be a tough primary for us. But you know what I think? When I look out at the thousands of people who are here tonight, the thousands of people we saw in Buffalo and Syracuse and Rochester, I think we've got a surprise for the establishment. I think that if we have a large voter turnout on Tuesday, we're going to win this thing. Thank you.